Well, great excitement here in Hobart. We're in the media village for Rolex and the great news is that Andrew Comanche is in the Derwent River. They've passed the Iron Pot and uh, have about a 20 minute lead over the hard chasing Law Connect. And with me is the voice of the Rolex Sydney Hobart, Peter Shipway, who's taken line honours on no less than five occasions. But Andrew Comanche, this is shaping up as a dream result for John Winning Jr. Yes, good evening Gordon and good evening to everyone. Um, Yes, it's been a terrific performance, no doubt about that. She's basically led from the word go. A few little minor incidents in the Hobart, in the harbour rather. Um, but since then, she's just kept on keeping on. And at the moment, she's got about six miles to go to the finish. She's well in the river. And Law Connect is about eight miles astern. She's not quite in the river yet. All four maxis around Tasman Island in the Storm Bay. Blackjack is about... Uh, seven miles behind uh, Law Connect in third place and then there's another reasonable gap of another about 17 miles to Hamilton Island, Wild Oats, she has just rounded Tasman. But at the moment there's wind in the river, that's the good news, a northwesterly breeze of probably 10 knots or so, so we should see Andrew Comanche finishing probably certainly within the hour I would think. So the, the line honours record, uh, they had to finish by 10.15 this evening, we're two hours past that so They've gone very close to the race record and these are live pictures coming up the Derwent River now. And uh, there's quite a big spectator flotilla out there following Andrew Comanche and a lot of people here watching in the Rolex Village right on Kingstock. And the good news is, Gordon, you can see she's got plenty of pressure, plenty of wind pressure there. There's no calms at the moment um, in the Derwent and there's the crowd that are waiting on the dock to welcome Andrew Comanche in big crowd there and uh, it's getting bigger by the moment I think it's a lovely warm evening in Hobart a, a westerly a northwesterly breeze and the temperatures way up which is very different to most Hobart evenings it's rather chilly but there's the crowd there giving us all a wave but the good news is there's wind in the river and Andrew Comanche within an hour of finishing so uh, at the moment uh, it, things are looking terrific for a, a good win but the battle really is going on for handicap honours outside uh, Storm Bay and down the east coast of Tasmania. Well, Pete, the, uh, the Comanche were fighting warriors. They fiercely resisted the white settlers in North America. And it's been all guns blazing, hasn't it, uh, from the, the one o'clock start in, in Sydney Harbour just a day and a half ago. But uh, it's been a, a dream race with those following conditions, a very quick race for the 100-footers. It has, Gordon, but I think also once we hear from the crews, I think it would have been tough today out there the wind was up probably 25, 30 knots and these boats are big powerful boats and there's no room for mistake and uh, we knew overnight that Wild Oats had blown out a spinnaker um, but we'll, I'm sure that there's uh, some interesting stories to come but there's a live drone shot of Andrew Comanche. Not that much wind there, she's just making reasonable time but uh, there's wind, that's the main thing and see the torch on the sail, the trimmers would be looking at the sail trim to assist the helmsman as they coming up, uh, the spectator craft gathering around her but uh, relatively calm but enough breeze to keep her moving. There's the angle of heel and uh, obviously that's accentuated by that big keel that they can move from side to side. They've got about uh, 11 tonnes of bulb hanging off the end of that keel so it's a pretty awesome bit of equipment but it's hydraulic they tack it from side to side when the boat tacks and uh, they're just furling up one of the headsails there you can see it the front sail flapping I think they are furling or unfurling it it's a bit hard to see um, I think they've probably unfurled it at the moment but you can see the weight coming off the stern that's the good news but uh, there's, there's plenty of pressure there in the wind you can see the lights of Hobart await her yeah, well, Law Connect is in more breeze at the moment, uh, trailing by six nautical miles. They haven't quite entered the Derwent River. So, Peter, we might just check out the, the tracker. Um, they're doing 20 knots at the moment, Law Connect, in second place, roughly about 20 minutes astern of Andrew Comanche, skippered by John Winning Jr. Yes, well, there, there's the, uh, the live tracker that, of the river. You can see Andrew Comanche, he's, he's, she is tacking up the river. You can see the course she's made from behind her, that orange line. And uh, Law Connect is around, uh, around the Iron Pot and uh, approaching Opossum Bay. And she's off South Arm. And uh, boy, it's, uh, 
She's closed the gap, but uh, I think with the wind in the river, I think at the moment, obviously, uh, Andrew Camarchi is looking fairly strong. Yes, every indication uh, here uh, at the dock that that wind's going to hold for Andrew Camanche. And uh, you look at the, the fairy tale of this boat, um, Ian Murray, a nine-time Lion Honours victor on Wild Oats 11, uh, swapping cabs uh, as the sailing master, and John Winning Jr. being influenced by Ian Murray to, to look at this boat, which was stuck in Antigua uh, under previous owners. And uh, he liked what he saw, and through the Panama Canal they came, and uh, here they are now, uh, approaching the finishing line in the Derwent River. Andrew Comanche in the 77th edition of the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. Got good pressure there. She, you can see that wake off the stern, as I said. She's well heeled and making very good time up here, 10 knots plus at least. And this will give her her fourth line honours victory in the Rolex Sydney Hobart Race, a tremendous performance. You can see those little speedboats behind her making good time as well, so that just gives you some indication of how fast she is travelling. But uh, for Law Connect, well, it's been a good performance too by Christian Beck and his crew, headed by Tony Mutter and Chris Nicholson. It'll be the uh, fourth time that they've got second place in the race. So poor old Christian Beck, he's, uh, this will be the third time as owner he's got the second. Presumably they'll finish that way. But uh, So a good performance, but not quite good enough to get the the job done this time. Yeah, well, you are taking on the, the fastest 100-footer in world ocean racing, and this uh, live telecast going all over the, the world at the moment, and so much interest. I'm, I'm sure that Jim Clark, um, the original owner of Comanche, uh, would be watching the finish here in Hobart. Certainly a, a lot of spectators here, and they're coming out of the woodwork. That's the, the great thing about Hobart. Once word is out, that uh, the Lion Honours boat is closing on Castre Esplanade. People come from everywhere and we'll have some very vibrant scenes here very shortly. Well, this is the remarkable thing about this race, Gordon, that the, no matter what time the boat's finished, there's people to welcome them home. And it, it makes this race very unique around the world. It's a, a wonderful welcome. It's nothing like it anywhere else. I've sailed in a couple of other major races and you know where at any finish like this that uh, the people come and welcome your home. Fastnet race, there's lucky to be a, one man and his dog to see you finish, especially if you finish at night. Even during the day, there's hardly anyone there. But this race really captures the imagination of everyone, and especially the people in Hobart Town. Here's Comanche, Andrew Comanche now. Looks as though she's just about to go into attack, going from starboard tack to port tack. There they go. See those red instrument lights on the mast? They are giving the helmsman and the trimmers an indication of everything from boat speed to wind angle. And uh, there's the overhead shot of, from the drone. Rules Conditions getting very light. They are, as they're approaching the finish. They are getting a bit light. Still six miles from the finish. Andrew Comanche and uh, Astern, Law Connect, um, is, is doing twice that speed. They're about 14 knots at the moment. And they're 10 miles astern. But uh, it's all calm aboard Andrew Comanche as they uh, drift now in very light conditions. Well, that's this got adds light that little there. bit of, there'd be some that nerves. Bit of drama, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, there'd be some nerves. A bit of a spectator wash. That won't be helping them um, from one of the spectator boats. But they're just starting to get rumbling now. It takes a long time in this light weather. Because these boats are so wide and they've got a lot of wetted surface, that's the boat in the water, it takes them a long time to wind up after they tack in these light airs. But you can see now she's just starting to get moving at a lot better pace. So they'll try and minimise the tacks. They're well heeled there. There's probably the keel is helping them heel over to, to get uh, momentum. And once they get momentum, the keel will move out to windward, flatten the boat down, and uh, they'll get to uh, much better speed. You can just see the crew moving around. There's a few torches going on the, on the sails to give the trimmers and the helmsmen an idea of the right wind angle to sail, but uh, she's definitely on the wind there and uh, on port tack going out into the middle of, of the Derwent River. Well, what a contrast um, to last year when the fleet started in that uh, very fierce southerly. 20% of the 88 yachts uh, were out of the race with boat damage on the first night, but uh, favourable following conditions for 
the 2022 Rolex Sydney Hobart. And this is the first appearance of Comanche since 2019 when she took line honours over the then Info Track. And we had that situation, Peter, where just two hours separated the five 100 footers, then known as Super Maxis. And uh, they were all in the Derwent River. And at the moment, um, we have two of the 100 footers in the Derwent. And again, um, it's Law Connect. It was Info Track, the boat then, back in 2019. And Andu Comanche, looking very smooth, very calm. And I'd imagine the, uh, the excitement is, is palpable on board. They departed Sydney in, in very emotional circumstances uh, with the death just the three days earlier of Ian Murray's mum. And there was a very emotional farewell at the Woolwich dock and uh, all of the crew wearing black armbands. But now they're ready to celebrate and I'm sure there'll be a dedication to Ian Murray's mum uh, with this victory. Well, she's got plenty of pressure there. She's, she's moving very, very nicely. She's hard on the wind, but uh, there's, there's plenty of wind. But as we know, as you get closer to Hobart, this river can play a lot of tricks with you. So let's hope that the wind will remain. And uh, there's the sight from the drone, and it's relatively calm, but enough wind to keep her moving. And this boat, Gordon, built in 2014, was as you said by Jim Clark, was built to break records and boy has she done that. Now she holds the transatlantic record, she holds the 24 hour mono hull record, she holds the Transpac record and this year already she's won the line on us in the Sydney to Gold Coast race, the Cabbage Tree Island race and also the Caribbean 600. So it's been a stellar year for her and uh, the crew would be I think very delighted if not a little bit nervous as they approaching Hobart in these lightish conditions and a few of the experienced guys on board probably headed by Ian Murray just know what this river can deliver or not deliver in terms of wind but things looking pretty good there on Port Tack standing out and uh, next approach will be to the John Garrow light and then there's a couple of miles there from Garrow to the finish. So just over four miles now to the finish for Andu Comanche. And, and looking at the, the makeup of the crew, John Winning Jr. said it's, it's the best crew they could assemble. And uh, it's quite an eclectic mix, Peter. A lot of 18 foot sailors, a couple of brothers, one of the brothers having his first Rolex Sydney Hobart start. Yes, that's the brothers are Nathan and Peter Dean. And I think it's, a, it's gonna be quite a sombre moment for those two boys as they, uh, lost their father, John Dean, who was a very good friend of the Winning family. He was tragically drowned on Winston Churchill when she sunk in a tragic 1998 race. And uh, I think uh, the Winning family have somewhat dedicated um, this race and previous races to the Dean family. And it's, you know, it's a bittersweet moment for, for Nathan and, and Peter Dean, but a wonderful moment, no doubt. And I'm sure their thoughts are very much with their late father. And John Winning Jr. really uh, had to do a bit of convincing, I think, for the brothers to sail together. They weren't talking at, at one no. stage, but, but I'm sure they are at the moment. And uh, just over four miles now to the finish for Andu Comanche. And talking of the Winning family, you've had a close association with the legendary John Winning Jr., uh, a former world champion in the 18-footers. The uh, he's on board for his seventh Rolex Sydney Hobart. He's not a, a keen ocean racer, but he would have enjoyed this one, I suspect. Well, he, he is John Winning Jr. The skipper Herman Winning is really John Winning Jr. See, Jr. Yeah. Because they're John Winning Jr. Jr.'s grandfather was John Winning. So there's uh, three dynasties of John Winning and their father or grandfather was an outstanding skiff sailor on, on Sydney Harbour and a, a well-known figure. Um, and of course, yes, John Winning senior on this boat is a good friend of mine I grew up with him we raced sabos together and he was my best man and he's godfather to my son so we're very close and uh, we've known each other for 70 years or thereabouts so I'm thrilled for him thrilled for the family and it's a, a wonderful performance and uh, I I know they were favorite but you know often the favorite gets nobbled uh, but they haven't let anyone down and the boats performed brilliantly and the crew performed brilliantly so full marks to them and uh, 
But I think, you know, let's take nothing away from Law Connect and the other two maxis, Blackjack and Hamilton Island. They've, they've pushed hard, just come up a little short. And uh, we're watching now. The, the lights of Hobart are waiting. Andrew Comanche getting close now to the finish. Big crowd here. There's still breeze in the river. It's a lovely, as a warm night in Hobart, as I said. And uh, the time is uh, something like about half past 12 in the evening. There's the crowd there. They'll give us all a wave. And they will uh, await the arrival. Just behind us, or in front of this crowd, the, the, the line on his boat will come and dock. And there'll be presentations. I'm sure there'll be... There's the dock where she'll come into uh, after they drop the sails. And uh, no COVID protocols this year. They'll just come straight in. And uh, there'll be a presentation. And I think, Gordon, you're presenting the crew to the crowd after they get off the boat. So, you know, a lot to look forward to. Um, but a lot to look forward to in the next 24 hours, I think, with all the other boats to come in. And really, the real prize is the handicap prize. And boy, that's up for grabs. And uh, there's a lot of boats in the running for that. But the conditions tomorrow, there's a gale warning out uh, for nor uh, waters north of Tasman Island up to Wineglass Bay. Uh, from the north to northwesterly, then it gets round to a southwesterly change later in the day. So that's going to play a big part in who's going to win this race overall. I think the 60 and 50 footers, the TP52s, will get round Tasman before that southwesterly hits. So it's, I'm still thinking the TP52s will probably figure in the overall prizes, but they're still 200 miles out or less, so still a lot to play for. Well, the Tasmanians haven't had a huge success over the years in the 77 year history of the Rolex at the Hobart but certainly alive Duncan Hine uh, who won the race on handicap in 2018 has done splendidly in that pocket maxi range from 60 to 80 feet well, so the, they're looking good aren't they at the moment she's fifth on the water she's right. the next boat after the four maxis she's at the moment she's uh, 22 miles east of Cape Sonoret up on the east coast and uh, 107 miles to go so that places are about 67 miles from Tasman. So, and she's doing 22 knots, and boy, they're putting in a hell of a performance. They could easily win their second race. You know, they won in 2018, and uh, here they are right on cue to, to do it again. So she'll be strong, as will the TP52s. The leading TP52 is Caro. She was one of the race favourites. She's uh, got 149 miles to go, so she's... 109 miles from Tasman, so still a lot to play for, but it's fresh out there. She's doing 22 knots, um, and there's breeze at Tasman as we're looking at uh, Andrew Comanche still on port tack. Those red lights, as I said, Gordon, behind the mast, they're big instruments that allow the helmsman to see the boat speed, the wind angle, uh, allows the trimmers to, to talk to the helmsman, they're talking all in tandem about how to set this boat up and how to go to maximum potential going upwind. So they're reliant very heavily on these instruments. There's a wand at the top of the mast that gives wind direction and wind speed. And they just look as though they might be just setting up to get ready for attack. But uh, at the moment, I can see a red protest flag off the back of Andrew Comanche there. And, uh, well, have we got something more to play here? We've, the last few years we've seen that... Uh, come into play, the red protest flag, but here we go. We're going to tack onto starboard. They'll tilt the keel over to give the angle, a bit of angle of the boat to heel over. There they go, that's, you can see she's got two rudders. A lot of boats have this now because they're so wide. That's the orange rudder at the stern. Uh, conventionally, most yachts have a single rudder, but these wide bodied boats have two rudders. And they've got maximum power there was a great tack there there's plenty of wind and she's approaching now quite quickly the finish of castra esplanade yes the two wide bodied 100 footers are first and second at the moment blackjack and hamilton island wild oats much slimmer uh, virtual sister ships and andu comanche now Still just looking at those instruments, probably doing about 12 knots at the moment. Lot, you can see that red uh, protest flag just on the starboard stern section of Andu Comanche. We've just lost that a little bit at the moment, but uh, she's gone right over towards uh, Tranmere to tack, and uh, she's now on starboard tack, and she could be laying the garrow and the finish from out 
She's gone so far over to that side of the uh, of the river. Spectator craft are gathering, and what a sight! Look at that massive mainsail and massive sail area on this boat. And that's what she's aiming for: the lights of Hobart. And just over two and a half hours outside the race record for Andu Comanche. And this boat indeed holds the race record at one day, nine hours and 15 minutes for Jim Cooney and Samantha Grant before they sold the boat. It's that average, uh, that record, Gordon, that you were talking about of, of the one day nine hours is an average speed of 18.9 knots. And to average that speed, you've got to be doing plus 20s most of the time. So it is a difficult record to break. Um, I don't think it's impossible by any means. I think we're going to see in, in future years, if you get boats like these four maxis back, that it is possible that they will certainly lower that record. And we, uh, we saw this year, we thought that uh, certainly Andrew Comanche would go close. She's fallen short by a couple of hours, but I think in future years that, that record will get even lower. And, you know, who knows? It could go to 24 hours, and uh, that would take some doing, but it's not impossible. Well, it looks as though her, her margin over Law Connect is going to be around 15 to 20 minutes. We've had some, some very tight finishes over the years. The closest ever back in 1982, when Condor of Bermuda beat Apollo by just seven seconds. Yes, that was a phenomenal finish in daylight. They're both coming up the river with spinnakers. Boy, it was close and boy, it was thrilling for the spectators. But there's no seven seconds in this. Look at Andrew Comanche now. She's fully wicked up here. You can see the spectator craft, the speed they're doing, give you some idea of the speed of Andrew Comanche now. She'll be doing 11 or 12 knots. And I'd say pretty close to laying the finish, finishing line. She's got to pass between a boy and uh, two boys off uh, Battery Point, Castro Esplanade. The sail's set to perfection. They're just breathing nicely, as they say in sailing terms. The air ex exhausting off the sails. Just a single headsail rig up, probably the, the J1 headsail. And uh, the crew all perched up on the rail give a bit more stability. Triumph two, Peter, for the Californian navigator Justin Schaefer in just his second Sydney Hobart yacht race. You can see the red protest flag there, Gordon, just fluttering off the, the stern. But yeah, Justin Schaefer, he, um, interestingly, he came aboard um, winning appliances, which uh, the winning family chartered in 2018, and they, they finished uh, fourth in this race. And uh, the, that boat was one of the itchy barns that Matt Allen owned, the 60-footer. They performed very creditably to get fourth. And Justin, um, I think John Winning Jr., Herman, had met him in the States and invited him to come across. And he raced uh, in four years ago, and uh, he's back this year in, in the navigator's seat for Andrew Comanche. Well, when we were strolling down this evening, Peter, to the dock, we could see a, a half moon over the, the peak of Mount Wellington. The breeze is still holding nicely for Andu Comanche and just a matter of miles now to the finish. She's, she's doing 11 knots. Yeah, that, that looks about uh, terrific speed and uh, finishing line closing in quickly now. And we've got Law Connect. Um, she's three, about four miles behind, but that's dead downwind, so she's got to be tacking up. So in actual distance sailed and time sailed a bit, a bit longer than that. Um, Blackjack is uh, just short of the Iron Pot by about two miles, three miles, and at Hamilton Island Wild Oats is uh, just west of Cape Rowell with 30 miles to go to the finish. As I said, Alive, Philip Turner's 66 footer is the next boat on the water with 103 miles to go. But at the moment, there we are. There's Andu Comanche. Just sit back and admire this performance from this crew and this boat and almost certain to gain fourth line honours for this craft. She won in 2015, 2017 and 2019. 
massive loads on these boats, Gordon. I mean, uh, the loads on the runners, they're the, the stay that you can see off the transom at the back there. When they're fully wicked up, there's a load of 24 tonnes on those runners. Uh, um, amazing power that these boats generate. The loads on the, the sails, the loads on the sheets are absolutely enormous. They can pump six tonnes of water in as water ballast if they need it. They may have a little bit of ballast in now, but if they're in fresher condition, six tonnes of water can move side to side in about two minutes. The motor is going all the time because you need that to move the hydraulics for the winches. All the winches are hydraulic hydraulically driven. The keels hydraulically move from side to side. So the motor needs to keep running to generate all the power needed to operate all those systems. So they have a, an engineer on board um, who keeps everything running to make sure there's enough oil in the gearboxes and enough fuel in the fuel tank and he's got a massive job. He's as important as anyone on board because if there's a failure in the motor or the engine and the engine stops, the boat stops. So he's a critical part of this whole operation. Well Peter, I think two of the busiest people have been Sven Runo and Harry Smith, the, the two bowmen, and it's a special moment for Sven. Um, I, I believe this is his eighth Lion Honours victory. Yes, I, he's been on Comanche before and uh, he's been a long time member of the Wild Oats campaign also. And uh, uh, Harry Smith, well, his father is uh, the very well-known yachtsman Ian Smith, who was a long time member of, uh, of the Wild Oats campaign. And uh, I'm sure he's and wife Rosie are sitting back just admiring this scene and uh, very proud of Harry. And uh, Ian, of course, was a member of, with Ian Murray in the Kookaburra. America's Cup campaign, and he's raced Admiral's Cups and uh, America's Cups. And that blue high-rise, I believe, is Rest Point Hotel Casino, and uh, that's the scene at, at Sandy Bay, as people will be driving towards the dock here in the centre of Hobart. Uh, you would have spent a bit of time there, Gordon, at the Rest Point? In the well, I, yes, Peter, I oh. was there for the opening, actually. I think from Did memory you? it was opened by the late Jerry Lewis, who was a great partner of Dean Martin, but well, that's probably before your time. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Did you win any money? I think I own a couple of bricks down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, the breeze is getting lighter, but th there's a, certainly enough to, to keep a rocking and rolling at the moment. I don't think there'd be too many nerves aboard uh, Andrew Comanche. It's quite still now. You can see the spectator boats have slowed down. And uh, this river really plays some tricks, doesn't it? I mean, oh, OK, now we've got plenty of pressure here. Uh, no, no worries there. You can see the exhaust water coming out of the stern or the transom of Andu Comanche there. That's the, uh, the cooling water for the engine. That shows that it's ticking over. And twin, twin steering wheels. Yep. And we had some graphic uh, onboard commentary, didn't we, at the start? on the Seven Network coverage with yourself and, and Mark Beretta. And there were times there where we heard John Winning Jr. say, I'm on the helm now, I'm on the wheel, it's my wheel. It's literally a, you know, seven or eight metres to get across to the other wheel. Yeah, he changes sides when they tack and someone holds it until he gets to the other side and as soon as he grabs the, the correct wheel, he calls my wheel, but uh, there we go. It's Another uh, special uh, man on board, Sam Newton. Uh, a member of Tom Slingsby's Sail GP crew. Tom Slingsby just smashing it in the Sail GP. And Sam Newton completing his ninth Sydney Hobart. Outstanding yachtsman, uh, no doubt about that. He's a crew on the 18-footers. Uh, he's won multiple JJ Gilton and World Championships, mainly with Seve Jarvin. Uh, he's crewing this year for Herman winning with, in his 18, along with Seve. So the three-man 18-foot crew are all on board here. And uh, Sam, uh, yes, as you say, is an integral part of Tom Slingsby's Sail GP team. And how many helmsmen uh, would be used uh, over the, the last day and a half? Oh, well, not, of, not everyone can steer this boat at optimum speed. They're difficult beasts, especially in a seaway. So they've probably got four to five main helmsmen, I think. Um, if the conditions are a little bit more gentler, they might bring some of the lesser guys on to maybe have a steer to give the main steers a bit of a break. But I think mainly there'd be four or five only that would be steering the boat. 
Well, Ian Murray gave us a bit of an insight into the uh, the difficulty when conditions are fresh, even going downwind, the, the pressure it puts on your body and your back, the concentration required. Graham Taylor, 26th Sydney Hobart for him. Would have had his uh, helming duties along with Pablo Arate in his fifth Sydney Hobart. But we're in just looking at Sandy Bay off to the left and closing on Battery Point and the finishing box at Castre Esplanade, which is manned by officials of the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania, which is the, the host club here in Hobart and uh, a wonderful ally for the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia. Well, just getting back to the steering, Gordon, uh, the windier the conditions, the, the harder it is because you've got to be very accurate in your performance because one little mistake or one way down the wrong wa a wave can really bring you to disaster and it could be catastrophic, especially in these big boats. They're fully loaded up and uh, the, the top steers are extremely good, extremely accurate to keep the boat um, up to speed and without uh, having any damage. But you can see the speed now coming off that starboard rudder, that uh, orange rudder, you can see a good weight coming off that. She's well heeled and uh, the crew are just looking now for the flashing spinnick, uh, flashing finishing boy. And uh, they go between the two of them. And uh, there she's got a really good heel there now. And not far to go. Well, it was Ian Murray's comment, when we go to sea, we go to battle. <laughs> yes, well, battle they've done and battle they've won. A fourth cherished Lion Honours Victi in the revered, globally renowned Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race for Andrew Gamachi. And let's hope that, uh, well, that that uh, red flag of the protest flag doesn't come into play. We can only hope that uh, everyone's clear, but maybe if they've still got the flag flying, they may want to go to the jury for whatever reason. But uh, anyway, let's... Uh, Ignore that for the moment and just sit back and celebrate this uh, stellar performance. And we saw Wild Oats 11 and Andrew Comanche do penalty turns, Peter, after the start. Um, a, a double turn to make sure that they had complied with the, the rules. If they had infringed, there was some doubt on Wild Oats' part that they had infringed, but they took the right option there because... Uh, they were bitten once before, weren't they, with Comanche when they finished ahead of Comanche across the line but then were penalised on time and line honours went to Jim Cooney and Samantha Grant. Not long to go now. The breeze is still in and where we're sitting on the, on the dock, it's, uh, there's still plenty of wind about so this is going to get them home and... I would think it Law Connect home, Blackjack and Hamilton Island, Wild Oats. Blackjack is just in the river in third spot and she's uh, 18 miles ahead of Hamilton Island, Wild Oats. But all eyes now on uh, the race leader and uh, we suspect the race winner. And she looks as though she may be laying the finishing line here. At the lights of the Hobart CBD and also the Tasman Bridge in the background looking quite spectacular as we go past Rest Point Casino. So now getting very close to, to Battery Point, which is the next suburb along from Sandy Bay. And uh, just off on the shoreline there is the, the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania and the Derwent Sailing Squadron, two fantastic sailing clubs here in Hobart. They produce so many great yachtsmen and women. So all of those crew on the weather rail at the moment, just soaking up the atmosphere, Peter. Uh, you've been in this situation. Um, what's going through your mind? The emotions must be almost like a roller coaster. It's uh, relief and joy, really. Um, relief that you've got there in one piece. And then the joy, of course, of, of being first home. And uh, it's a special feeling. 
and these guys will be very, very um, pleased, thrilled, whatever word you like to use about this performance. Because it's tough being a favourite. You know, everyone's expecting you to to get home, and often that doesn't happen. Get home first, but they haven't let anyone down here, and um, they've had a lot of pressure on them to perform, and they've performed brilliantly. And uh, the performance has, has been absolutely outstanding. And just looking out, uh, Peter, behind us, uh, they're getting very close to the finishing line now. And they're, they're going to be just under three hours outside Comanche's race record. What a splendid performance as we're closing in now on the dock and, and looking out towards that eastern shore. See the we flags see the there lights. on the dock there. They're there's plenty of wind there, or certainly enough wind to, to keep uh, Andrew Comanche moving, as we saw her before. And there's all the and there she is. port lights. There she is. Very, Very close, close to the now. finishing line now. She's probably there now. Not quite. Not quite. Stand by. There's the finishing box. Should see a flashing light shortly. There's the flashing light. You can just see it. In the middle up to the right, that's the flashing light. She's probably got 50 metres to go, laying in beautifully to the finish. What a sight. And there's going to be absolute elation, joy, tears for this great victory. And it's going to be a 10th line honours victory for Ian Murray, the sailing master, who has nine to his credit on Hamilton Island Wild Oats. Here's the finishing line in the 2022 the Rolex point. Sydney Hobart. Stand by. Three, two, one. There she goes. Well done. Congratulations. A triumph for John Winning Jr. and his outstanding crew as they take line honours and the Illingworth Cup, the Challenge Trophy in this 77th edition of the Rolex Sydney Hobart. Fantastic performance, just under three hours outside Comanche's race record. And uh, they're going to be about 20 minutes ahead of the next place, Law Connect, who's yet again the bridesmaid. Hugs and shakes all round for this crew that uh, have got the job done. And uh, they'll just lower the sails now and come into the dock and uh, a hero's welcome awaits them because the crowd is getting bigger as as we speak and there's uh, a f over a thousand people here I would think Gordon at the moment already to, to welcome them in and if you're watching please come down it's a lovely night here and uh, it's warm you won't need a jumper and there's the crowd there all in t-shirts and just awaiting the arrival to give them a hero's welcome so four line honours, what a performance, eh? She joins, you know, a, a stellar group of yachts that have won this race. Um, right from the very first year in 1945, Rani, the little boat captained by uh, Captain John Illingworth that won the first race. And how different these boats are. He had a little 36-footer that won. And... Uh, of course, you, you look at some of the boats that, that have won the, from Wild Oats to uh, or Bumblebee 4, Brindabella, some famous names. Karawa, of course, seven victories. Um, even, Solveig, um, Ondine, Stormvogel, Fidelis, the first New Zealander to get line on us. I mean, names that have created history in this race. And, uh, well, this boat is already a line on his victory, but as Andrew Comanche, that name will now go into the record books and uh, she will join those list of um, famous yachts that, that, that have won the race. Kealoa has won it. Two different Kealoas have won the race. You could go on and on. These so sovereign boats that have, have, are absolutely famous Australian yachts and overseas yachts. Yeah, Kealoa 3 was the, 
the first boat to finish inside three days. That yes. was back in yeah. 1975. Yeah. And here we are, what, one day, 11 hours and, and around 50 minutes, just under three hours outside the race record for this majestic ocean flyer, the 100-foot maxi, Andu Comanche, built by Jim Clark and supermodel Christy Hens. They made a big impact when they arrived in Hobart, and this is a fourth line on his victory for this boat. And as John Winning Jr. told us, uh, he was invited over to sail GP in San Francisco by Ian Murray. They spoke about the fact that Andrew Comanche was sitting forlornly uh, in Antigua, and he said, why don't you go and have a look? And the rest is history. Well, what now for Andrew Comanche, I guess? Um, probably they'd look forward to next year's Hobart race, Gordon, I think. Uh, they've got the boat for a, a long period of time. Um, Herman Winning wants to do more racing with the boat, and uh, she's proved unbeatable so far in a, a short stint in Australia under his command. There's a few more long races to do, and uh, maybe a few more records to break, but I would think if... Uh, He'd be quite keen to come back next year and perhaps uh, see if they can lower the record that's held by this boat. But of course not when he was the, uh, the owner. That's when Jim Cooney was the, uh, the owner. And Jim Cooney in Willow, the former Volvo 70, is performing splendidly uh, amongst those mini maxis. And they're probably back in, I think, across the, the water, back in about sixth place at the moment, Willow, the 70-footer. But Jim Cooney would be across this finish with Samantha Grant, his wife. And uh, he sold the boat uh, to overseas into Russian interests back in, in 2019. Well, that was pretty special, Peter Shipway, to to see that finish for Andrew Comanche and John Winning Jr. There's a whole um, documentary series being made on the boat. Yeah. It's been warts and all, and uh, there have been cameras on the boat, and, and every time you actually blink, uh, there's a, an Andrew Comanche camera there. So we look forward to that. Just had a nice message from Ian Smith, uh, father of Harry. He's watching from his farm in Glen Innes up in uh, New South Wales. So uh, good on you, Smithy. You must be very proud, you and Rosie, of Harry's performance and uh, hope you're well and uh, well I'm sure Harry will have a drink or three for you in a half an hour's time or so but there's Comanche now just getting the sails down you'll notice all the crew would have had life vests on which is part of the rules that uh, between the hours of sunset and sunrise you've got to wear your life harnesses it's just a part of the very stringent safety protocols that uh, this race requires. 24 strong crew, uh, international sailors, world champions, Olympians, Volvo racers, and uh, some outstanding 18-foot champions as well. So it's just a brilliant mix. And uh, a lot of left field thinkers too, Peter, young blood that have brought a new dimension to the performance. And uh, Ian Murray, well, he's always looking at a new way to skin the cat, isn't he? And I believe they carried an extra pole as well to assist in their uh, kite changes to, to actually yeah. cut the time down and maintain the speed and all those little incremental improvements. Yes, uh, they, these, these big wide boats, they don't carry spinnakers as such as that we know. They, they carry what's called asymmetrical spinnakers that a spinnaker by definition is symmetrical, both sides are the same length, but the asymmetricals uh, fit off the bowsprit and they push a pole out to leeward to give a better sheety angle. So they did make another pole to put out the other side if they were jibing to save moving the pole from side to side. And those poles weigh 70 kilos, took them about half an hour to get into position, so they made two poles. So if they were jibing, they had one each side. So, so roughly your weight. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yes, <laughs> weight for age. Um, so uh, they're the little things, as you say, that, that Ian Murray brings to a, a campaign like this. But we're just having a look at the tracker now that uh, Law Connect is, uh, she's off Taruna, she's just tacked off Taruna to go across to Tranmere. Um, 
Well, there's a live tracker that mightn't be quite a live tracker, but anyway, Blackjack's in the river. She's approaching Opossum Bay and uh, still uh, Hamilton Island Wild Oats to arrive in the river. So what a race. I mean, there's Law Connect. She's only going to be half an hour or a little bit more behind. Um, Blackjack probably another half an hour again. So three of them finishing within an hour. And we thought that at the time that the conditions would suit the bigger, wider boats, which was Andrew Comanche and Law Connect, and that's came to come to pass. And uh, maybe next year the narrower boats that like lighter weather might be their turn. But they've all had a turn. Each of these four maxis has won line honours before in this race. Um, of course, Wild Oats has nine times and Blackjack twice, once as Alfa Romeo and last year as Blackjack uh, and Law Connect. Just the solitary victory. But Christian Beck, who purchased the boat a few years ago, this is his third time for, for runner-up. So I would think he would be determined to come back. Well, Peter, um, it's a day and a half ago now. It seems like an eternity uh, when we're on Sydney Harbour and you were calling the action for the Seven Network. But uh, one journalist described it as the wild west on water <laughs> uh, with the four 100-footers jostling with the, the rest of the, the fleet of 109 yachts. So let's now reflect on all the mayhem and excitement. The graphic start on Sydney Harbour on Boxing Day 2022. 2022 Rolex Sydney Hobart, right, the great boys. race south is on. And a great view there of the four start lines now, those four waves underway and heading towards Sydney Heads before they make that big right turn out. OK, here's the battle, the majority of the fleet on starboard. These guys, these guys, these guys. OK, here we're seeing a tangle up here of these maxis. Boy, this is close here. Protest, get a flag on there, that's fucking bullshit. That was... OK, we already heard a protest being yelled by Andrew Comanche. They didn't get any room to tack. Incredible drama already in this race. The, the drama and the voices of the crew, especially on Andrew Comanche. She's coming back on port. She's going to have to tack again. They've got clobbered by going in there, those bigger boats. Law Connect coming across on, on port. Now, it will be interesting to see if they fly a protest flag. Here comes Law Connect. She's bouncing off the spectators in the exclusion zone. She's coming across on Port Tack with no rights here. She's going to take a stern. She's across from oh, Whisper. Oh, this is close. Yeah, we're going to have a water call here. Okay. And I'm wow. going to say you can, and then we're going to take a couple of maxis. Yeah. 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 Be best. Be best so, what we're seeing here is wild oats. Hamlet Island Wild Oats trying to hold hey, we should, Black like, Jack down yeah. there. I agree. Yeah, what a now these big wide boats, going here, the breeze slow. northeast about 15 knots. Mark yes. Richards, uh, probably as calm as he's ever been. Jibon, 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 Jibon. Not now, Jibon, he wants some Jibon. But when Law Connect tacks, he'll be on to yeah, the attack, we're in good shape okay, here. Okay, good shape, says Mark Richards, they're clear ahead. They're clear ahead of Law Connect. Here we connect. go, guys. Helms down, taking down. Here we go. We're just going to get very light as they approach these turning marks. They get the influence of North Head. So it's going to be quite tricky now until they get to the inner turning mark. So they're the four maxis. They'll probably go, one, two, three, and four. The order at the moment, up, possibly up, Hamilton Island Wild cover Oats. Up, now here's a close go. Andu has no rights here. She's on port tack. Wind coming from the left hand side. She'll have to duck. Okay, I've got it, I've got it. Nettie's got it, I've got it. He's got it. Means he can see the other boat. He knows how close he can go, Herman Winnie. <laughs> Oh, here's a close go. Blackjack is absolutely threading the needle between Law Connect and Hamilton Island Wild Oats. Wow, Mark Rambles. Wow, terrific job. Wow, that was nervous stuff. So the 4-4 four, four are up. in the mix. Cover down, please. Are right in the mix. Okay, stand by to tax the call from Mark Richards. Tack tack on starboard. Here two short tacks. Take One, up. and then two. Yeah. So they've all extracted yeah. themselves yeah. very well, these yeah. maxis. To get up to the first four places, Wild Oats, a short little tack, two boat lengths, Stand attack. 11 minutes, just on You're 12 right. minutes to the turning mark. You're right. You go. Great this job, Wild Oats. Up a pretty favourable shift. We've just seen him turn the, the uh, distance mark right now. Yeah, sure. Great job by Wild yeah. Oats and Mark Richards, but man, that was some of the closest crossing I think I've ever seen in the race so far. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, yeah, think, we're doing the turn. Got to do turn. I think we hit. 
Yeah, they did hit the, they did hit the mark. Where can I do it? So Andrew Comanche. I'm not having a protest. You ready? Okay, there's plenty of drama here. Look, let's look at this again. Yeah, yeah, Andrew Comanche has the start face. attack rights. You on the other helm. You on the other helm. Okay, You're let's ready see. Ready to turn? Ready to turn? Yeah, the, the turning mark's gone down their side. Protesting. There. Protesting. Oh, it's all happening. It's, it's all happening. Okay, there's Murray Jones. They're clear. Wild Oats is on her way. And that's good. They can go to Hobart, as I said, with a clear conscience. Boy, that was close, as Jimmy right? said. Um, these four maxes have thrown the boats around like skiffs. So that's two spins they need to do, and they'll clear their penalty, and they go out of the race. Trip to Hobart. But what Mark Richards was saying to Murray Jones, have we infringed? Murray thought they might have. Mark said no. Will they do penalty turns? Who knows? And here's Law Connect. She will leave at the second turning mark. She has really driven hard in this breeze now, which is freshening outside the hedge. You can see the white caps. Law Connect, there's the turning mark. Turning mark, Zulu. Now will Hamilton Island Wild Oats do some penalty turns? That's the question. Let's go. I think Murray Jones, the tactician, is saying maybe we did infringe and perhaps we should do the penalty turn. They thought they may have infringed in the harbour. Murray Jones, the cool-headed tactician from New Zealand, has said to Mark Richards, maybe we did and we should do our penalty turn. So they're doing the penalty turn. Mark back Richards gym, wasn't in agreement. He back said, no, gym. I think we're OK, but they're not taking any risks. And this is the smart thing to do. So they're on their way with a clear head now. Hamilton Island, Wild Oats now getting their reaching sail unfurled after doing the penalty turn. A little bit too small to get overall honours, but Adrian Kahalan aboard, one of our most celebrated female skippers, as we watch the bow of Comanche go down and point towards Hobart. All right, let's go down to the water with Jimmy Spittle. Yeah, hey, guys. We're just over here off... North Hare, Uber Maxis, choosing to do penalties. I think that was a wise decision. It's a long race. Let's do our turns and then let's get on with it. So I think that was a very wise decision and, and as was with Andrew Comanche. But yes, the battle is really for the handicap honours, the Tattersall Cup, and that's the real prize. And I think the weather, the way it is, looks as though the 60 or 50 footers, TP 52 footers, could figure highly in that race. And there's Andrew Comanche. She's starting to wind up now. She's going a little bit to seaward of the fleet, which is a better speed for her. But as the day goes on, the breeze will get fresher and certainly will be an interesting battle for handicap honours. Will they break the record? It's going to be very close, I think. They've got to be there by quarter past ten tomorrow night. And the weather modelling says at the moment that Andrew Comanche is due at 11 o'clock. Yes, Peter, fabulous pictures and action and, and commentary on the Channel 7 telecast. But we can tell you that Andrew Comanche has finished the race in 2022 in one day, 11 hours and 51 minutes. So just under three hours outside her race record. And uh, the crowd really applauding that. Uh, the crew just wrapping things up at the moment, Peter, tidying up the boat. I, I guess family uh, in the powerboat are maybe alongside and passing on their well wishes, but a very special moment for Andrew Comanche. But what about the, the chasers? Law Connect, uh, probably about three and a half miles from the finish at the moment, and Blackjack then uh, also chasing hard, further back to Wild Oats 11 in fourth place. Yes, well, uh, we're expecting Law Connect shortly, and uh, we'll just have a look at the tracker. Uh, we'll just stick with us here of where uh, there we go. There's Law Connect, a very similar course to what uh, Andrew Comanche did. She's tracked a tack right over towards Tranmere, and then she's trying to lay into the finish. But uh, and there's Blackjack. She's sneaking up. She'd be enjoying these lighter conditions. But was, is there enough runway for her to catch Law Connect? It's uh, doubtful, but uh, anything can happen in the Derwent River, as we say. Well, they've closed the gap to just three miles at the moment, yeah. and they're, they're certainly uh, going nicely. They're d doing 12 knots um, blackjack, and Law Connect is just a couple of knots slower at the moment. So blackjack chasing hard, and they're going to close the margin, but 
I think time will run out. And Law Connect now is closing on the finishing line. Remember that one day, 11 hours, 51 minutes. So about 25 minutes ago, we saw Andrew Comanche finish. And uh, we're only, what, half an hour behind here with Law Connect. Uh, the Christian Beck 100 footer, the wide bodied 100 footer from making, the Greenwich Sailing Squadron. Yeah, making reasonable time. Probably hasn't quite got the breeze that Andrew Comanche had. See the torches on the sails just to give the helmsman and trimmers an idea of what the trim should be. But she's well heeled there. The crew on the weather side, that's always a good sign. And uh, another experienced crew, uh, Tony Mutter, the New Zealander, is the sailing master. Six times around the world he's gone in a yacht. If, if you like that sort of thing, he obviously does. He's a two-time winner of the what was the Volvo Round the World Race. And the tactician, Chris Nicholson, very popular Australian yachtsman, a dual Olympian, yachtsman, Australian yachtsman of the year. And uh, Nico has been around a long time and absolutely terrific sailor. And uh, Christian Beck has, again, put a very good team together. And uh, the navigator is um, a guy called Chris Lewis. Chris, an American. Um, uh, from the, the West Coast, and uh, he was navigator on Warrior One, a boat that's in this race when she won the Bermuda race. So Chris has done the race before, and uh, he's going to get a, another second place, oh, a second placing now. And you can see, I think that's the flag of the Ukraine on the leech and the foot of the mainsail there. So great support by Christian, and I, I think we're all, all behind that, but we won't get into that right at the moment as we enjoy the scene overhead from the drones of Law Connect, the boat that started life as speedboat and then became Rambler and then became Perpetual Loyal, then Info Track. So she's had a lot of names and now she is Law Connect and uh, this will be her fourth second place finish. And when she won in 2016 as Perpetual Loyal, owned by Anthony Bell at that stage, she held the race record at that time of uh, one day and 13 hours, and that was lowered lowered by uh, and uh, by Comanche. And also, interesting, Law Connect has a protest flag as well, that red flag, and we saw her fly that or in the incident at the harbour that uh, she uh, had a close couple of close crosses and uh, they yelled protest and that flag flying. So there might be a little bit more to play out here, Gordon, and uh, who knows? Well, Tony Mutter, as you mentioned, when they broke the course record in 2016, was on board. And he was also on board Comanche uh, the previous year yeah. in 2015. So, yeah, a couple of protest flags from first and second uh, across the line to add to plenty of drama. But uh, certainly, um, yeah, people have converged on the docks now. And uh, very shortly, we'll see Andrew Comanche come in here to the dock just behind us and uh, we'll see all of the celebrations. Um, the Commodore uh, will go on board and uh, present the trophy. We'll also um, have the Managing Director of Rolex Australia, the, the great race sponsor. Um, and it'll be a great scene here um, as we speak to you from the, the Rolex Village right on the dock here. And a reminder, Peter, that uh, each day uh, throughout the race, at 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time and also 4 p.m. in the afternoon. We'll have our live crosses from the studio just updating you with everything that's happening in this Rolex Sydney Hobart. And, and you can follow it on the Facebook page, the digital channels and the Rolex Sydney Hobart website. So it's all covered. So when do we sleep, Gordon? Do we have a um, bed here or...? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think you might be <laughs> slipping away before I do. But we'll have the, the presentation um, uh, for the folks here on the main stage Terrific, yeah. and the Wonderful. premier the premier of tasmania uh, will be making the presentation of the medallions uh, which will be very Wonderful. special for all crew well just as we're waiting for uh, andrew comanche to, to do come to dockside um we're looking at the handicap list at the moment and uh somewhat as expected four of the tp52s are leading on handicap, but I must stress they've still got a long way to go. Warrior One that I was referring to a little bit earlier, uh, Chris Sheehan's boat, um, she's leading, and those 
uh, uh, terms at the top, you might be wondering what they all mean. Obviously, the yacht, the division she's in, the position, that's the latitude and longitude. DTG is distance to go, so you can see Warrior 1 there has 137 nautical miles to go. SOG is speed over ground, she's doing 17.1 knots. That's a, a, a spot speed really, it's not an average speed. And COG is course over the ground, so she's sailing at a course of 217 degrees. Um, so that would mean, I would think, that she has gone well east of the rum line, she's now jibed to come in uh, on her approach to Tasmania. So she's 137 to go. Celestial is lying second. Um, Sam Haynes's boat that was provisionally first last year but was rubbed out to second because of an infringement, uh, not having his radio on and he was penalised. Guelo third and the boat that I think is still a strong chance is Caro in fourth place. Let's give a little plug to Hutzpah too. Bruce Taylor from the Royal Victorian Yacht Club. Um, Peter, I think they have more Sydney Hobarts on board than any other boat in the fleet. I think it's up around 256, and Bruce is closing on 50 trips to Hobart. Um, famous Victorian yachtsman, and they're doing splendidly on handicap. Well, we say it every year, it would be a popular win. Bruce has had a number of chutzpahs. He's, over the, the years, these 40 Hobart races, he's had 22 divisional placings, and he's won his division six times. His son, Drew, has been with him on 28 races. Most of the crew have done 20-plus races, as you said, a multitude of races, and they've all done together. So it's a fabulous crew, a terrific guy, and, uh, boy, if he could get the, the victory, it would be one of the most popular victories in the history of this race. And, Peter, uh, we see in seventh place there another TP52 Enterprise Next Generation, Anthony... Uh, Kirko from WA. Now they lended assistance to Peter Wrigley's Coa, um, which had uh, rudder damage and forced to retire. So they will get a redress there on time. And uh, they're part of that contingent that are dominating the handicap situation, the TP52. Yeah, she's a little bit smaller, Gordon, than the TP52, but she's built on that style of boat, a very fast running boat, and those are the conditions they've had for this race so far. So she is right in the mix, but I must say that these positions, they can change quite dramatically. So don't read too much into it at the moment, but I think the TP52s are uh, in pretty strong position, and we think uh, we're hearing that Law Connect, Christian Beck's yacht is close to the finish, and there she is. Well, what a great moment for Law Connect. And uh, they're going to be just over half an hour uh, behind Andu Comanche, second across the line again, but driven hard by Tony Mutter, uh, the sailing master and skipper, uh, and his outstanding crew. A brilliant crew on board. And Law Connect also had four uh, members of staff who'd had no sailing ocean racing experience whatsoever. So uh, a large crew, larger than uh, Andu Comanche, but what a special experience for those four members of staff who were part of a ballot, apparently. Yeah, Christian draws them out of a hat yeah. and says, if you want to go to Hobart, you're on. Boy, they were a, a good trip. year. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. A run basically all the way, just on the win now, and very close to the finish for a second place. Well, well done, Christian Beck, Tony Mutter, and uh, Chris Nicholson and the team. Well, Chris Nicholson is the first to admit he gets very seasick in rough conditions, <laughs> but I think he would have survived pretty well this year with his slow release, there are, seasick there pills. Across. There across. <laughs> well done, Law Connect. Second place. Second place. Just over half an hour behind Andu Comanche. Christian Beck's Law Connect. The Disappointed other but elated uh, in, in the one breath, I think. They've uh, really... Uh, put in a, a very, very good performance. Uh, they've certainly kept Andu Comanche honest. One little mistake from Andu Comanche, it could have been Law Connect's prize, but not to be. So he's got to come back next year, I think. Let's hope he does. He's been a terrific competitor in this race and one of the nice guys of Australian yachting. And Petey, please correct me, but is Troy Tindall on board. Troy is on board, yes. Yeah, the is, main yep. sheet trimmer, yep. ex Wild Oats, mm -hmm. and uh, a very famous sporting family. Absolutely, he's a Kiwi, um, Troy, and his grandfather, Eric Tyndall, not to be confused with the 
one time wallaby or one test wallaby eric tyndall from australia troy's grandfather uh played cricket for new zealand played rugby for new zealand he umpired test cricket and he refereed test rugby so that'd be hard to beat well, Peter, he actually refereed a test match between the Wallabies and the All Blacks in 1955, and Australia lost 8-0. 8-0. Uh, oh. home, hometown referee. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's changed these days in rugby. Yeah. Anyway, uh, full marks to uh, the Law Connect, and, of course, the next boat to finish will be um, Peter Harburg's Blackjack, who um, won line honours last year. And... Uh, and Peter Harburg on board this yeah, year. Yeah. Uh, he took himself off last year uh, for the sake of the crew in terms of uh, the conditions that were expected. Yeah. But uh, Peter was elated, wasn't he, when you, you had him up on stage saying, yeah. this is a, it's been a 14-year exercise with Mark Bradford mm. um, and Blackjack finally getting the line on us and again performing splendidly. And, of course, the boat named after Jack Brabham, yeah. the Formula One world champion, Australian, who was a great friend of... Peter Harburg. So yeah, he uh, was a multiple Formula One yeah, champion. Yeah. Had great battles with uh, the Englishman Sterling Moss. Mm. Um, anyway, um, I think the whole race this year was, was set up with the excitement um, of the presence of the, the four 100 footers, the, the maxi boats. Um, they really are the glamour boats. They take all the attention. The race is not about first across the line. Um, it's about who wins overall on handicap. So a 30-footer can actually take the overall prize. But there's no doubt that uh, the 100-footers hog the limelight. And uh, they will say, deservedly so. And the sailing fraternity Hobart is their Everest. Tell them you don't know Hobart, they think you're, you know, think you're second to God. There's up to 100 yachts that will start the Sydney to Hobart yacht race, but there's only four of Maxis vying for that line on its victory and that's why the competition's so intense. I don't like coming second to anyone and if someone underestimates me then that's usually at their peril. Andrew Comanche, which is now back in Australia thanks to John Winnie. It's no doubt that the Comanche is one of the best 100 footers in the world. As soon as Andrew Comanche is in that right weather window, she's unstoppable. We're out to sort of prove that that wasn't a one-off and we'd love to do it back-to-back, -back, um, but we know it's going to be a real challenge this year. No one messes with the Oatleys in the Sydney to Hobart. They're out there to win. When the racing starts, everyone's pushing up. I rate all the other boats with huge respect. Any of the boats are capable of winning. The stakes are so high. There's so much that can go wrong. One wave, one broken mast. Have we lost the engine? Boats don't stop going faster. So the edge is as far as you're prepared to push it. The team has to be united. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. The wedge between 200 foot is going at a fast pace with nowhere to go. Did not see them till way too late. You make a mistake, this thing will eat you. It will bend you over in a heartbeat. It's not one I've ever done, but at some stage you haven't sort of thought, oh, you're going to make it. But I know it's going to be treacherous and challenging and scary at times, but... Listen, bring it on. We're not going to the start line looking to come second. When we go to water, we're going to battle. And there's the, the splendid scene. Andrew Comanche and uh, also Law Connect having crossed the finishing line. Law Connect... Uh, just over half an hour after Andrew Comanche, which completed the 628 nautical mile journey in one day, 11 hours and 51 minutes. So uh, just under three hours outside Comanche's race record. But a, a splendid scene here at the dock in Hobart. And uh, very shortly, Andrew Comanche will be 
moving into dockside here uh, for the celebrations and the presentation. Peter Shipway. Yeah, emotional scenes really. I think the, uh, the crew will be um, really proud of the effort and uh, so they should be. And uh, a big crowd awaits them here to give them a, a real hero's reception just behind us. Uh, just looking out now, we can just see their navigation lights approaching. There they are. Just see the width of this boat, Gordon. It's immense, isn't it? You know, eight plus metres in width. And they're a massive, massive machine and uh, they've put in a massive performance. Well, this makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? Uh, the moment that you, you dream about, um, probably as young boys, and some of these crew on board Andu Comanche and the CBD of beautiful Hobart forming a magnificent backdrop for Andu Comanche as they edge towards their dockside berth. It's funny, it's a beautiful evening as we keep saying here in Hobart. I mean, I've been across Storm Bay when there's been snow on Mount Welling, it's been absolutely freezing. But here it is, it's an absolute contrast and such a warm, lovely evening has attracted a huge crowd down and they're just about to come through the, the breakwater and uh, just getting a bit of speed up now as they're coming in and uh, the reception awaits. Peter G has been out on the water. Um, I don't know whether Peter can hear us, but Pete, you might like to come across and apparently there were a few interesting moments um, for Andu Comanche, but we might just get your thoughts on having been out on the water as to what happened. Well, yeah, it was just interesting uh, at the mouth of Ralph's Bay there. All Hobartians have known that we've had some uh, bulk carriers, uh, LNG carriers, but they're moored out there and uh, four of them in the river, two at the mouth of Ralph's Bay and they went to the, uh, the western side of the second last one, then had to go inside to, uh, onto the eastern shore to uh, get over there towards uh, Tranmere to uh, lay the mark from, from Camelot back into the finish. So they weaved in between the two uh, big uh, tankers that every day a, there. Every day occurrence on Sydney Harbour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's rare for us down here though to see uh, the big shipping there, but uh, they had a, a terrific view, yeah. along with about 20 spectator craft, the police boats and all the RYCT boats uh, there in attendance, but uh, and about two tiny little tinnies when we got here to the finish line too. I'd, uh, Pete, how was it uh, when they crossed the line? Um, were the family close by and friends? I um, couldn't really. Uh, there were yeah. uh, a lot of media, of course, yeah. on the media boats. Um, uh, there was applause when they finally got across Castro Esplanade there, but especially when they uh, dropped the sails out here, then all of a sudden there's a lot of cheers from everybody on the spectator fleet. She's just reversing in now to the dock. She'll be alongside within a couple of minutes, I would think. And uh, as they say, all hell will break loose. <laughs> Champagne aplenty, um, presentations. And I know, Gordon, you've got to get the crew up on stage shortly to present them with their medals and awards and the, the John Ellingworth Trophy, which is four line honours. A most yes. treasured trophy in, in Australian yachting. And uh, later on, in a few days' time, the Tattersall Cup will be presented to the overall handicap winner. And who might that be? Well, who knows at this stage, but uh, it's going to be a real battle for that trophy. We'll hear some rousing support um, as Andu Comanche approaches her berth, having won the Illingworth Challenge Cup, named after Captain John Illingworth, the skipper of the inaugural winner in 1945, the Tiny Rani, which finished actually uh, in six days and... 14 hours, I think, so yes. yeah, well into the new year. Uh, it was a slow journey. They got lost there at one point, but um, they were heroes. They were thought to be lost at sea, actually. Uh, that was quite a story in that first race. But the Commodore of the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania, Richard Bevan, uh, will be up on stage with the Lord Mayor of Hobart, uh, the Commodore of the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, Arthur Lane, um, will be going on board with the Illingworth Challenge Cup. And the Managing Director of Rolex Australia, Benoit Folletti, uh, will have the magnificent Rolex timepiece for the winning owner-skipper. 
John Winning Jr. and the Premier of Tasmania will be presenting the medallions. Jeremy Rockliffe and uh, the Tasmanian government has struck these special medallions. Okay, here she comes now. She's about 50 metres away from docking and uh, just before she does tie up, we can just say that Law Connect, uh, just looking at the finishing times, finished just about 23 minutes astern of Andu Comanche. So the two boats are in. Blackjack's got about a mile to go, but here it is, the winner. We'll just listen to the applause that awaits this mighty boat and mighty crew. There's the crowd that have gathered here to welcome her home. Three cheers echoing out across the dock. Reversing in. Yes, eclipsing, uh, as Peter mentioned, Law Connect by around 24 minutes. And Blackjack, Peter Harburg, um, currently just a, a couple of miles from the finish. They'll just tie up. I'm sure the, the bubbly will be flowing very shortly. The crowd now giving them another big cheerio as they come in. You can just see the crowd is fantastic, isn't it? The, the w warmth of the welcome in Hobart is, is unsurpassed anywhere around the world. 24 strong crew on Andu Kamachi. Fourth line honours victory for this boat. And uh, just under three hours outside her race record. Just a, a marvellous performance for John Winning Jr., uh, Ian Murray, the sailing master, and this outstanding international crew. Yes, I, th I think, Gordon, they probably realised, you know, 12 hours ago or so that the record wasn't going to be theirs, and I think that would have been very secondary. They just had to make sure the boat got home in one piece and gives them something to come back for next year. Well, I think that must have been the attitude all the way, though. I mean, sure, you go as fast as you can, but you've got to hold the boat together, and yep. I think Ian Murray made that remark that observation that uh, you know we're not going to go crazy here uh, we want to get there in one piece we've got the speed we've got the yeah. crew yes and we've got the conditions yeah and there's uh, the crowds and a lot of press here to cover this race from both locally and uh, all over Australia and all over the world that come and gather at, uh, to celebrate this great race and uh, what a race they've seen and what a race we've had and you know it all started yesterday in Sydney Harbour with that uh, these four maxis in a real dog fight and here they are what one day 11 hours they're tied up alongside the the dock in Hobart and there's uh, we can see who we got there we can see I can see Sam Newton there there's Seve Jarvan Sam Newton on the left Seve just to his right there's Seve Jarvan And uh, as, as John Winning Jr. Uh, Herman said, it's all about getting the, you know, the culture right and getting the best people on board. And everyone has to play their part. Uh, just one little weak link in the chain can bring things unstuck. And this has been a flawless performance by Andu Comanche to clinch line honours in 2022. There's the, the winner's flag going to be hoisted up the force day. There's, that's Harry Smith, I think, with the flag. It looks with like the Rolex. Harry. The Rolex flag will be flying proudly. Yeah. I think that's Harry. With he's a rigger, so he knows how to tie the flag on. I'm sure. <laughs> Just that will be hoisted aloft. That's given to the. Line honours winner, and I think each divisional winner gets a, a flag, and also obviously the overall winner. We've seen a big media contingent. There are probably half a dozen uh, television cameras here representing various media organisations, and everyone 
very ordered and well behaved. Yeah, I haven't seen Herman winning yet. He must be, is that him down the back or his father? No, who's, yeah, that's, that's Herman there. That's him there. A very proud skipper, no doubt. And how big is that grin? Yeah, well, it's a few dollars worth, that's for sure, <laughs> a few dollars worth. But he, he put it out there and that's his... I can see Ian Murray there uh, across in the background as well, just yeah, loosening his collar. He'd be uh, just Probably feeling a little clammy, Peter. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, Ian, he, he, he doesn't jump into the limelight, but uh, he'd take things pretty easy. So what are we... Just waiting now, I think, for some more dignitaries to hop on board. Probably the, the two Commodores will go on board and... Uh, Pass on their congratulations. What a beautiful evening. Bree's a bit lighter now, so Law Connect is home. Blackjack, we've lost track of her really, but she's uh, she'd be pretty close to the finish, I would think. I think she's a couple of miles from the finish at the moment. We'll have a look on Still the Still in a bit of breeze. Just over two and a half miles from the finish for Blackjack. And she's doing nine knots, so she's holding her breeze. And notoriously, the the breeze shuts down overnight in, in Hobart, but yeah. it's held for the 100-footers. Well, there's Arthur Lane uh, with the Illingworth Challenge Cup. Just looking for the skipper. Being presented to John Winning Jr., and the managing director of Rolex Australia, Benoit Folletti, um, in the white slacks, will now present the champagne. But moment of triumph for John Winning Jr., skipper and owner of Andu Comanche, chartered for the next few years, and uh, a magnificent result, a fourth line honours victory for this maxi yacht. Arthur Lane, the Commodore of the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia with that Illingworth Challenge Cup. Just want to drop it in the water. And then in the background there's John Winning Senior. You just see him there. The black uh, dark hat on. It's his second line on his win. He was on Bally Who when they won in 1976. He was crew member on Bally Who. So it's his second line on his victory for John. I remember that uh, race finish, Peter. They, Jack Brooklyn actually had some go-go dancers greet them, um, wearing uh, bikinis on that's, the dock. So that's the way to go. Plenty of colour. That was Jack. He had plenty of colour <laughs> about him, that's for sure. But uh, just, Gordon, while we're watching the celebrations go on, I just the battle is still going on outside Storm Bay. The uh, Tasman Island, it's blowing 30 knots. It's expected to last most of the, the night and then freshen even again tomorrow. So, um, wow, the handicap battle is going to be fierce. And uh, I think the 60s and 50s twos will get round and across the bay and uh, then the little boats are going to get pummeled by the sou'wester. It's going to last 24 hours before the breeze goes back in the nor'east. So, who knows? Um, we're still 24 to 48 hours away from knowing who the handicap winner is, but one thing's for sure, we know who the line honours winner yes. is. Yes, well, John Winning Jr. said, we, we're we not here to finish second. No, um, they didn't. And they were true to their word, and uh, they led the rest of the, the fleet a merry dance once they took a controlling position in the lead. They covered their lead, and they've done it in one day, 11 hours and 51 minutes, just under three hours outside the race record, and about 24 minutes ahead of Law Connect, the other wide-bodied 100-footer. So, Peter, just uh, before a final go, word? Final word. The tail ender is Currawong. The little 30 two footer. About it, 30 yeah. footer. Uh, sailed by the two ladies, uh, Catherine Veal and Bridget Cannon. They uh, have got 420 miles to go still. And here's Andrew Comanche tied up. Well, you know, it just shows what a contrasting race this is. So, they have a northwest of Green Cape. Um, they're still not into Bass Strait. 
420 miles to go. Good luck to them. Let's hope they have a safe trip and a safe arrival here. Well, they've got a nasty yeah, southerly change yeah, coming too. Yeah, they have. It won't be so severe that far up the coast, but yeah. then it'll get back in the nor'east. But anyway, they're, they're a few days away well, from those, finishing. Peter, those two senior ladies have uh, 134 years between them. I well, think, you can't yeah. talk about ladies' Kathy, ages. Kathy um, is, is, has hit 70. Um, hit 70, so wow. She has hit 70. So She's just a youngster. She is. She's there a youngster. She is out there. Yeah, terrific. Um, battling Mother Nature. So we'll be back for an update at 9 a.m. in the morning. It's now nearly 2 o'clock in the morning local time. Off Australian to bed. We're Eastern off to Daylight bed. Time. I am. You're not, I, Gordon. I'm going to have the presentation <laughs> on stage. But, but join uh, Peter Shipway and also Peter G at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then uh, we'll be back again at 4 p.m. And I'm sure we're going to see some exciting... Uh, finishing with those smaller Absolutely. boats, the, the 50 footers and the, the pocket maxis, I think, will be in certainly before then. But we look forward to your company here from Dockside at the Rolex Village here in Hobart. See you at 9 o'clock in the morning.